Our guest today is an award-winning Chicago journalist. He spent 37 years covering politics, business, education, and day-to-day -day news at the City News Bureau, Chicago Sun-Times, NBC5, and ABC7. He retired as ABC7's political reporter six months ago after covering the inauguration of President Barack Obama. He was recently named as the executive director of the Better Government Association. Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Shaw. Andy? Thank you. I'll stay here. Okay, you see our logo up there. That's the bulldog or the pit bull. I think the bulldog is more appropriate, but because uh, Jay bent the rules and let me speak for a fifth City Club luncheon in June when the uh, calendar had already been filled, uh, I want to give him a special thanks. He's a role model for taking a struggling organization and giving it muscle and teeth, and he's a guy who understood that the need is too great for a strong BGA to wait till September to tell my story. So, Jay, thank you very much. You are a proud recipient of one of the Bulldog caps. I have a second one for Paul Green, but after some of those nasty jokes, I may, I may not be giving him that. And uh, like anybody who's uh, trying to rebuild an organization, uh, the new BGA, I've got about 150 business cards. And anybody who didn't hit me up for one on the way in should pick one up on the way out. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, David Orr, the clerk of Cook County, is here. David, a longtime ally of the BGA. And I want to thank, there are a lot of members of the BGA board here. I want to thank you one and all, because I think if you hadn't bought up some of these tables, there would be about 20 people here. <laughs> board President Dave Lundy is here. He gets a special acknowledgement because, because he's going to help me get through this PowerPoint presentation. Remember, I was a news guy. I don't know anything about this stuff, so bear with me, guys. In 1972, a guy I knew called a guy he knew, and I got my first journalism job the Chicago way. At the, at the City News Bureau, that legendary training ground for the likes of Mike Royko and Carl Sandburg and Kirk Vonnegut, and Charlie MacArthur of the front page days. I didn't have a degree in journalism. In fact, I hadn't even taken a single journalism course in college. But I had a journalism gene. My mother was a writer and a columnist for a neighborhood newspaper. And I had a work ethic gene from my dad, who was a hard worker from dawn to dusk virtually every day. So with a limited amount of ability, but an awful lot of drive, I joined this esteemed profession in 72. At the City News Bureau, I covered everything. The police beat, city hall, county building, federal building, schools, even O'Hare Airport. A year and a half later, I moved to the Sun-Times, where I covered business and ed then education. In 76, I went to Channel 5 to cover education, general assignment, and then politics. And in 1983, I joined what was then called WLS, now it's ABC7. Spent 26 years covering politics and government alongside my retired colleague Hugh Hill for a number of those years, and then on my own. It was a labor of love for all those years. Uh, I loved every minute of it. But like so many things, in the last few years, I began to think, would there be life after ABC7? It was wonderful. I loved the people I worked with. I loved the stories I covered. I loved the people I covered. But I just finally said, you know, Got to get off the merry-go-round. There has to be something other than life at ABC7. So I did this in a nicely symmetrical way. My first big story at ABC7 was the election of Harold Washington, the city's first black mayor, sparking that titanic battle known as Council Wars. My last big story, the election of Barack Obama, the first African-American president. In between those beautiful bookends was 15,000 TV news stories, give or take a few hundred. I left after the inauguration, took a six-week vacation in warm weather, came back and decided to sort of see what was there for reinvention, Andy Shaw 2.0, what would it be? I tell a lot of people that 
I was never really retiring. That was never the plan. I was leaving ABC7 to figure out what else to do. I didn't know what that was, but the intent was not to go out to a Dell Webb uh, housing project in Arizona. <laughs> not in my nature. I may be old, but I've got a lot of energy left. So somewhere along the way, um, I heard about the BGA job because the former executive director, Jay Stewart, had gone back to work for his friend, Pat Quinn, in the governor's legal office. Went through the due diligence and got the job at the BGA. And I've got to say, it, it was too good to pass up because the need is great. It's a perfect match for my old skill set. And so off we go. Now, the BGA is the city's preeminent anti-corruption watchdog group. It was founded in 1923, and I think that the first slide, if we get it, if we can reach that far, it was founded in 1923 by a group of civic leaders, <laughs> by a group of civic leaders, and this is not one of them, but the civic leaders were sick and tired of the mayor then, William Big Bill Thompson, who, by the way, was recently voted the worst big city mayor of all time, the fact that he ran Chicago to the tune of mob boss Al Capone, and ladies and gentlemen, that tune was not my kind of town. Over the next 86 years, the BGA has tirelessly fought corruption, waste, inefficiency in a variety of ways, partnering on investigations, the most famous of which is the Mirage Tavern in the late 70s. This was the Sun-Times and the BGA buying a tavern in River North and installing cameras and microphones, hiring, using their own people as bartenders and waitresses and waiters, and then, like fish in a barrel, nabbing building inspectors and other city and county officials one by one, asking for bribes in exchange for providing their services. Along the way, the BGA won, part participated in two Pulitzer Prizes, won a Peabody, partnered with TV, radio, and also used the bully pulpit to argue for good government and the power of litigation. And one lawsuit in the late 90s was designed to force George Ryan to release some of the material that later formed the basis of the licenses for bribe scandal that put 70 plus people in jail. Another lawsuit of a more recent nature attempted to force Rod Blagojevich to release those subpoenas he'd been receiving from law enforcement officials. The BGA is small right now, and so I think of my job as to, along with my board and a lot of other people, to create a new BGA. Because I don't have to tell you who have filled this room that it's more necessary than ever for a variety of reasons. And I'm not going to point fingers because Andy Shaw, as executive director of the BGA, is not going after anybody. This is not about Mayor Daley or Mike Madigan or Todd Stroger. I will never, ever make this personal or vindictive or vituperative. This is simply going to be about good government. And it's easily defined. The BGA that I'm going to help grow and prosper and be strong and vital in this city is going to have three simple principles. One, accountability. That means that the tax dollars we spend need to be used on the goods and services and programs we need, not the bureaucrats and the cronies and the friends of the friends and the relatives that we don't need. Second, a level playing field, and this is important to those of you in the business world and who deal in gov with government and contracting. Jobs and contracts have to be distributed based on merit and not on clout level playing field. That's especially important. That's especially important, as my friend Guy Lebrana reminded me, with a lot of recovery dollars coming this way from Washington. Billions, perhaps. And if you deal with government and you have a business or you have contracts, I'm sure it's gone through your mind that you want a piece of that, but the process has to be transparent and it has to be legit. So as that money flows, someone's got to be watching especially at a time when traditional media is in a shrinkage mode. You know, we have two papers in this town in bankruptcy. We have television and radio stations hemorrhaging from the economic fallout, the, uh, the auto industry and the other advertisers who just aren't ponying up dollars. 
It's amazing we turn out as much good journalism as we do in Chicago, given the smaller size of the staffs and the demands on people, but it's working. Okay, so we have the three principles. And I'm going to hearken back to some, it may be a cliche, but bear with me because I can't help but use it. This is the 100th anniversary of Burnham's Chicago plan. That was the plan that preserved our lakefront park system to give us our seminal Chicago um, gem. This is our definition. This is our city. This is our lakefront, our park system. Few in the world can rival it. Rival it. From Howard Street to the far south side, with the exception of a couple um, miscreant buildings that got put up along the way, we have a pristine and beautiful lakefront for that we thank Burnham. And I'm going to paraphrase his most famous sentence because depending on how you read the Google uh, listings, it could have been said any one of three or four, day, three or four ways. There was no YouTube or uh, microphones and cameras to capture it exactly then. But make no small or make no little plans for they lack the passion to stir men's blood or stir men's soul. No one's quite sure what it was, but I think we all know what it meant. And it's in the spirit of Burnham, who's one of my heroes and arguably the most important Chicagoan historically, that I tell you what we're going to do at the BGA to help deal with what I consider to be an unprecedented crisis in government at all levels. I have about four or five plans that if I can raise money and get foundation grants and get new members, we're going to be able to put together and we're going to be a major force in this town again. We're going to build a huge interactive website. And that website is going to be interactive. It's going to have all the news you need about government and politics, local and national. But it's going to have some really wonderful features that's going to make it, in my opinion, a town hall forum for people. You know, we have 13 million people in Illinois. And I would venture to say there's more than a couple who, like Howard Beale in that famous movie Network, are mad as hell and don't want to take it anymore but don't know what to do. You know, there's an election every two years or four years, and I think some people feel that they don't really affect the outcome, and it's Tweedledee or Tweedledum, be that as it may. I want them to come and live with us uh, virtually on a website. So what are we going to have? We're going to have a pothole page. You got a big pothole in front of your house, you take a picture with your digital camera, you email it to me. And I'm going to put it on our page with the date. And there's going to be a calendar that shows how long you've been waiting for it to be fixed. And when it's finally filled, you call me or email me, we'll take it down. We're going to have a waste page. So you see a work crew of five people standing around a work site in your neighborhood. This isn't to bust any individuals. Send me a picture. Give me the address. We'll put that on our waste page. And you know what? That'll stay there until that project is finished and the workers have gone on to something else. We're going to have a Freedom of Information page where everybody who files a FOIA request can send me the information. I'm going to post them all with the date, and we're going to see how long it takes before they finally get the FOIA answered. And we're going to have a whistleblower page, a complaint page. I want this to be a place that everybody has to visit a few times a day to know what's going on, and not just visit, to participate. Again, not aimed at any branch of government, aimed at violations of our basic principles. What else are we going to do? By the way, a lot of this is my fantasy, my bold dreams, because I'm going to have to raise money and get foundation grants. We're going to start a journalism training program. We're going to train investigative reporters on an intern basis from Northwestern and DePaul and Loyola and UIC. I'm going to bring in an old producer friend of mine who knows the way around the investigative producing world. He's going to help me put this together. We're going to take interns and we're going to train them in the skills that they need. And in exchange, they're going to partner with the reporters at channels 2 and 5 and 7 and 9 and Fox and WGN, Sun-Times, Herald, Tribune. And we're going to do a lot of the work that these news organizations can't do alone. We'll give the kids credit. At the same time, we'll get a work product and we'll get extra arms and legs and brain power to go out and do this stuff. If all goes well, we're going to get a weekly TV and or radio show devoted to good government issues where people can call in or send me a Facebook comment or a tweet. We can have live guests, format, undetermined, 
again, we'll get a grant for that. We're going to do a good government report card or scorecard. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get somebody to help us put together a matrix. What is good government? I'll tell you what it is. It's spending 90% of the money on goods and services and only 10% on administration, not 50-50. I'm just using those numbers. I'm not sure what the correct ones are. It's responding quickly to FOIAs. It's not having paid out hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits because your government wasn't functioning well or was abusive. And it's not having people in your office who've gone to jail for corruption. Those are just four, four indices. <laughs> and we're going to publicize that. And we're going to have a debate. The BGA is going to partner with one of our TV or radio friends or two. And we're going to have a good government debate in the, in the upcoming campaign season where we're going to use the report card and deal with the issues that make up good government. We have such a crying need now, as David Hoffman explained so well yesterday. We're at a virtual crossroads. And what I want to tell you, all this is aimed in one direction, and that's going to allow Dave to put up one more slide. We're going to eliminate the corruption tax. And let me tell you, it's so easy to explain. The corruption tax is, is the cost that is larded on to basic government services when they are wasteful, inefficient, and crooked. I don't want to pretend that I know the amount, but I, I will tell you that as a lifelong Chicagoan who is now freed from the shackles of objective quote-unquote reporting, I'm mad as hell, I'm tired of paying it, and you should be too. And it's not just about individuals. It's about everybody in Jerry Roper's chamber. Every time Every time government's more expensive, it's a disincentive to a company coming here. Every time that there's an indictment, every time it, that something looks to be only an inside deal, companies have a disincentive to come here. People have a disincentive to live here and work here. The morale of citizens goes lower and lower because we know we can do better and we need a strong BGA to get there. So. These are my dreams. I already have one foundation locally that is interested in helping me build the website. They're trying to push a grant out the door in the next couple of weeks. If they do, terrific. We'll put a full proposal together if I can find a grant writer, and then we'll get rolling on that. I've got four or five other grant ideas in various forms talking. We have a wonderful philanthropic community here in Chicago, so we have to tap into them. Every one of them is strapped by the economy but they're all committed to doing things that are, that are going to improve life in this city. And so those grants, I've been fundraising because you need to have money to run an organization. I've got to hire a lot of people. My, my goals and the goals of the board that's behind me on this are pretty ambitious. So in the first three weeks, I raised 100 grand. Sounds good? Yeah. Thank you. But let me tell you something. To do what I want to do, I need a million dollars. I need a million dollars until my grants are in the pipeline, and I'm actually getting grant money to help supplant some of the money that you need for early operations. So what my wife keeps telling me I need, and she's right, you know, I'm not a very religious guy, but I need a couple angels. I need them to land on my shoulder and write checks for, that have a lot of zeros. You know, got a lot of meetings left. Maybe I'll find people like that. Because you know what? This is a golden opportunity. It's a golden opportunity. BGA means something. The brand is good. The need has never been greater. And I'm not a bad messenger because people know me. And over the years, I think I did my news job with enough integrity and honesty and toughness and credibility to be able to say, you know what? View this as a startup. View this as an investment. If you think that we need the BGA and you think that I'm somebody who might be able to get a few things done with a help, then Join us, and on the cards, you're going to see what the website is, and maybe everybody in this room will join. You can do it for as little as 50 bucks, or you can add a bunch of zeros. Okay, end of pitch. I'm not a very good carnival barker. Let me just look at my notes and see, because I know I need to get to one more thing. Yes, okay. Let me get to the last piece today, because I'm just picking up on something that David Hoffman talked about yesterday. He reminded us that we are at a critical moment in a very interesting way, and this has to do with the 2016 Olympics. And I gotta tell you something, I've covered Rich Daly for a lot of years. And I know in my heart that Rich Daly's drive to get the Olympics was motivated by the spirit of Daniel Burnham. I know that. Make no small plans. Olympics are big plans. 
The problem is that the Olympic bid is at a perfect storm moment in terms of public fear. I would venture to say that the public fear and dread of what could happen with these games is at an all-time high, and the games are only one small part of it. We've had the meltdown in Springfield, and George Ryan, and Rod Blagojevich, and all the troubles at the county building, and all the indictments at City Hall. Then we had the potholes, and the high taxes, and we had the parking meters, and the mayor's nephew. And when you put them all together, and then, and then in Switzerland, the mayor seems to be putting people on the hook for whatever shortfall there is in the games, and I'm not going to debate him on that. He'll, he'll do his own explaining. I think he's got an explanation for them putting a plan together then you know that there's a chance, there's a lot of fear out there. I've probably never seen a climate in which there's less confidence in the general public in what we're doing in the city of Chicago. On the other hand, as David Hoffman said so eloquently yesterday, this is also a golden opportunity. What was Rahm Emanuel's line, never let a crisis go to waste? This is a wonderful opportunity, and, and, and let me just say one thing. I'm not for or against us getting the games either personally or professionally. For one thing, the BGA is not taking positions on these things. We'll let the public officials uh, decide whether something is or isn't what they want to do. We'll hold them accountable and look at the transparency and deal with the level playing field. And to that end, I may not have mentioned this, but one other thing I hope to do, and I hope to get a grant for it, is to have monthly forums on big key issues. To do a monthly forum on video poker or TIFFs, or term limits, or merit selection of judges, whatever people think is important. Videotape it, distribute it digitally to everybody who wants it, put it on our website, all the other websites, make it available to TV and radio and print, and then let it end up where, where things end up, where people can see it wherever, maybe it's can TV, I don't know. That's the fourth thing, but back to the games. There has been a spate of bad publicity about Chicago of late, and I know that at City Hall and at the 2016 office, there is a great deal of concern about raising the issue and talking about it, because there's a feeling that virtually anything is controversial, and virtually anything works against the bid. And so, there were some discussions about whether we should even be talking about the games today, to be doing anything that smacks of negativity. But what I'm about to tell you is not negative. It is, it's the most positive thing I can say. And this is the new campaign. It's called Clean in 16. And let me tell you what it means because it's very simple. It means that the BGA, with me possibly at the helm, but maybe not, will lead a committee of civic and community and business groups to monitor the flow of jobs and contracts and neighborhood incursions from the first day, if we get that bit. And let me make this really clear. I want the mayor as a supporter and an ally. I want Lori Healy and Pat Ryan and all of them to say, we're working with you because we agree. The goal of this is to allow Chicago to do two things simultaneously. Put on the cleanest, most transparent, best Olympic Games ever, and at the same time begin to exorcise the corruption ghost that has haunted us for all of these decades. Because it's in everyone's interest, if we get the bid, if we win, it's in everyone's interest to make these the best possible games. So here's what's going on, without being too specific. We've reached out to civic and community and business groups that shall remain nameless for the moment, but they represent a diverse cross-section uh, of the community, African-American, Latino, Republican, Democrat. The point is, put a group of people together as the committee and then try to get a grant or funding of some sort for the nuts and bolts folks to actually do the due diligence on a day daily basis with, I hope, the full cooperation of City Hall and the 2016 people. Now, let me ask you, is that antagonistic or is that, is that proactive and beneficial? I think that's an easy answer. Not picking a fight, not looking for trouble, not trying to suggest that there's anything wrong with Chicago, just saying that this would be a good thing in any city that gets the bid, yes or no? Desperately needed. Okay, so that's, that's the deal. That's what I'm trying to do with the BGA. Um, the, the, we got our logo back up. So I'll wind up with one comment and then take a couple questions. 
In 2009, a guy I knew told me about a guy he knew that had a job. And I got it, but not the Chicago way. The BGA board did due diligence. I came with a pretty good package of qualifications. And you know what? I'm ready to get it on because I think Chicago is one of the world's great cities. The corruption legacy doesn't need to... We were the city of losers until Michael Jordan came along. We obliterated that until Jerry and Jerry allowed it to go back that way. But let me tell you, nothing is forever. It has been a very rough couple of years. But we've had a lot of good years, too, in which good government did seem to shine through many, many days. It was not always bleak. As I said, the perfect storm the last couple of years has made us a national laughing stock, and it's time to wipe the slate clean. Um, uh, clean in 16 is not, is not a joke. It's not a pipe dream. It's a possibility. And here's what I'm asking you today. Join me in the fight for good government. Join me in the fight for good government because by myself, I'm like Don Quixote tilting at windmills. Let me tell you, Don Quixote was quaint and he was charming. But Patton won the war because he had the armies. And the only way we're going to have good government in Illinois is if you all and everybody you know demands it and figures out where there is a repository for the possibility of it. I'm offering that at the new BGA. I am re-energized at the age of 61. Reports of my retirement were exaggerated. Be careful what you wish for. My wife says I'm already working harder than I did at seven. But you know what? The beauty here is that this is, a, this is the cause of a lifetime for all of us. I come from a great set of initials, ABC, a powerful media brand backed by millions of dollars and hundreds of people. But I'm now involved in an equally, in an equally eminent brand called BGA. I don't have the resources of ABC, but they're out there. They're out there all around the state of Illinois, and I'm saying if you leave today with only one thought, take a business card and think about whether you, are, whether you really want to get on the good government train. If you want to be, if join us, be part of the good government guys and gals, and we can really make a difference in this city, and you know what? Smile and be proud again, and have a legacy with or without 2016, in which we're the crown jewel of the Midwest and not the laughing stock. Thank you very much. Come from the world of walking stand up, so you got to take it out. All right, well, very good. That was my friends uh, Jeff and Bruno at CBS2. Put it back in there. All right, question number one, Frank. Uh, from David Cohn, Union League Club. Uh, by the way, the City Club recognizes all other organizations as well, right, David? <laughs> Thank you very much. They all know what's number one. Okay. Investigative journalism has traditionally assisted the BGA, as you mentioned. Do the news organizations of our area have sufficient resources to continue in that role? Oh, you, want the mic? you know, the most interesting thing I learned in that six weeks that I was kind of hunting around and looking for Andy Shaw 2.0 was how much is going on below the radar screen in the field of journalism. Much of it is online. Much of it's invisible right now. I mentioned the two newspapers in bankruptcy and the financial struggles of all the TV and radio stations. I don't have an exact number, but that means that the firepower in terms of investigations collectively across the metro area has to be down 30% or more. I don't know exactly. So here's the deal. 
We have access to all kinds of people who can assist, who can partner, because if we can raise a little money and pay them or get a grant, we can send them to work with the media folks. The speed of the investigations will double and the output will double. I don't mean one for one. You're not going to take a Northwestern J school student and expect that they're going to do the work of Tim Novak at the Sun-Times. Not going to happen. But maybe you give... Maybe you give Tim two of them, and maybe they'll begin to stay, keep up with him. So my point is, we have resources galore. We have journalists who are, who are out of work because of layoffs. We have smart, young students who have taken courses, and now they just need to basically go out and get some experience and do the work. And in conjunction with Pat Raycamp, our chief investigator at the BGA, and my friend who will remain nameless for the moment until he really comes aboard, um, we're going to put it together. And I think the answer is we can, keep the, we can keep the work product up as high as it's ever been, but, it's gonna, but, but the role of a BGA is more important than ever. And let me just say this. I'm not sure who's going to partner with us on the Olympic effort, but it's not just the BGA. It's Lawrence Massal Civic Federation and the good work they do. Cindy Canary, Canary's Campaign for Political Reform, Jerry Roper at the Chicago Land Chamber, and groups like that, Change Illinois. There are a lot of groups that all want to see the same thing happen. And if we can put our minds together collectively and share resources in this difficult time, I think that we can do something that we'll be proud of, and it'll be extremely beneficial to the people of Chicago, Cook County, the Collars, and the rest of the state. Thanks for that really short answer. Here we go. Uh, guy used to work on television. He must have had four or five minutes for every... Uh, okay. Uh, this, this one's from uh, Paul Frank. Uh, uh, this is a good question. You and the Collins Commission seem too focused on the legislative powers, yet our most recent governors are the ones <laughs> heading or in jail. Aren't you think, don't you think the focus was misdirected this spring? I'm not going to battle, I'm not going to get in the legislative trenches. I will just say one thing. The reform bill that was passed in Springfield has more holes than a big piece of Swiss cheese, more loopholes than a corporate tax package, and most importantly, nothing takes effect until after the 20, 2010 elections. In the, under the guise of reform, so that lawmakers could actually say they did something, they did things that, in the estimation of people who know more about this bill than me, because they were working on it, is, is worse than reform. It's like negative two. I'm not going to debate that because I don't know the answer. I don't like what they did, but I will say this. The, the campaign for political reform can deal in the trenches of campaign finance and fundraising and all that, and I'll leave that to Cindy and her group. They do a darn good job. Change Illinois did a terrific job. Our wheelhouse, our job is day-to-day -day government. What we rely on to pick up the garbage and keep the streets safe and put out the fires and get the permits issued, government day-to-day -day affects us in every possible way. And if I don't do anything else with this tenure here, if I can make that government a little more efficient, a little less crooked, a little more responsive, then I think all of us will benefit. What they do in Springfield vis-a-vis -vis campaign finance, that's a whole different issue. I think the day-to-day -day monitoring and scrutiny of government at, is where the rubber really meets the road in a more critical way. Okay. Uh, we have three questions that are pretty much the same from Michael Levin, Rachel Go Goodstein, and John Ladd, Lag. Uh, the, the basic question is, late return. Uh, uh, is Chicago ready for reform? That's basically what they're saying. Uh, and obviously, since you have taken some Frank Capra lessons, uh, you think so. So, uh... <laughs> you could see why I am the moderator here. Leave no speaker untarnished. Um, is Chicago... Well, I, I know you haven't had the mic in a while. Is Chicago ready for reform? Okay, before I answer that in 30 seconds, when, when you finally give me the last round of applause, we're going to take a fast vote whether Green has earned the BGA Bulldog hat or not. <laughs> this is up to you guys. We'll decide, should I get it or should Green get it? Okay, the answer is, look, to me the cup is always half full. I am a positive guy. 
I liked almost everybody I covered over all those years, even if some of them would have doubted that. But yes, of course, I think people have basically good instincts. There are endemic problems which facilitate and exacerbate the problems. There's, there's, a, there's an institutional mindset, an institutional framework that makes it easier in some ways to take the low road. The low road has always been the most traveled road in our political world. And yet, every time Patrick Fitzgerald returns an indictment, or there's a splashy investigation on page one of a paper, or leading the 10 o'clock news, I think that's another disincentive to this continuing. I don't think that Chicago and Illinois is actually, are actually more corrupt than they used to be. In fact, I think that in many ways they're less corrupt in the, in the, in the absolute venal sense of law-breaking. But I think bad government is what the epidemic is. The lack of accountability, the lack of a level playing field, the lack of sunshine or transparency, which contribute to the corruption tax, that's what I think the real problem is, and that's systemic. So that's going to be the hardest to change, but I think, yes, it can be if we put the heat on, the pressure on, and if a lot of people join the effort. If you sit on the sidelines and you only get involved at a, BG, at a, at a city club luncheon or election day, things won't change. We need to put the heat on day by day by day, and I think if we do that, along with media and other uh, well-meaning groups, I think we can end it. No, I do not think that uh, Patty Baller was right. You know, it seems as if he was, has been right up to now, but I'm going to say let's prove Patty Baller wrong. Chicago is and can be ready for reform. A lot of Some of you youngsters don't know who Patty Baller was, but he never lost an election. <laughs> right, Mr. Reamer? Yes. Okay, to close, Andy, and you know, you can take a little longer with this question. Um, <laughs> this comes from Christine Long on the, our board, and uh, I'll just paraphrase it. Uh, she says uh, she believes the BGA needs a larger vision. How about a citizen trading program? The complaint ap approach is too scattershot. That's wonderful. Thank you, Christine. I may not have articulated this well enough, but let me just say that I think that if we do monthly forums on important issues, and if we create an interactive uh, website that basically invites participation in a variety of ways, and that could be blogs. I didn't mention the one other thing, and I apologize. One other thing we're going to do along with these investigations, and this is, apologize, please forgive me, in along with training people and doing investigations, we are going to begin what I call a monitoring program. And this is where I think some students can help me along with some out-of-work journalists. In my perfect world, we're going to send monitors that we've trained to city council committee hearings, county board hearings, metropolitan water district hearings, suburban village hall meetings, Springfield, we're going to get monitors, and you know what they're going to do? They're going to go out and cover it. They're going to read through budgets and proposals, and they're going to blog for us. They're going to blog, or they can tweet. They'll get material back to our website. Maybe it'll be in video form. Maybe there'll be sort of a commentary. In other words, we'll train them enough to make sure they're responsible and not loose cannons. We'll send them out, and they will tell us what's going on in ways that the media today has no time or manpower to deal with. And that dialogue, I, I hope that's something that you had in mind because the goal here is to involve people. I don't know how you do it with one organization other than the use of the internet nowadays because we're one small office on one person. One, let me, one last thing and I'll get rid of it. I did a talk show with a Rockford radio station and I got a couple calls with complaints and one woman said, Will you come out to Rockford and talk to us? Take a look at what they're doing out there. It's terrible. I said, ma'am, i got to be honest with you. I'm one person. I have a small staff. I don't think I'm going to get to Rockford unless I'm on my way to Madison. But I went to college in Madison, sorry. But I said, here's the deal. When we get the website up and running, you can come to me. Your problem with your governmental entity, whether it's a pothole or waste or inefficiency, you bring that to me. We'll find a place for it on the website. We'll force your government and political people to deal with it because it'll be there. We'll email them. We'll, we'll have a calendar or clock to show how long you've been waiting. The point is, I don't know what else to do. It seems to me that, that, that 
you've got to use a website and, and new tools nowadays. That's what's going to really get people involved. I can't think there's any other way. There's not going to be enough people to go out to every forum. You bring people to you. I'll, eventually, I'll do daily blogs, hopefully video, audio, and, and, and print, in which I'll weigh in on what's going on governmentally from the day before. All of these things are possible in ways, and if someone doesn't like what I said or they want to add or criticize or build on it, they'll send me an email or they'll send me a blog. We'll dialogue, and I think at the end of the day, I think this tool used properly gives us our best shot at putting the heat on public officials 24-7 and actually making a difference that is very hard to make in traditional ways. And with that... Well, I don't remember too many Facebook messages and tweets from the League of Women Voters in past years, but I'm not going to argue with you. All right. There you go. Uh, I want a round of applause. Uh, one more thing is... As, okay. Let's, let's, let's vote on the hat. Does Green get a hat? That's what you get when you do a spectacular job in all of your venues, as Paul has done in so many years, teaching, mentoring, radio, city club, and busting as many you-know-whats as he can along the way. Well, uh, first off, my late grandfather would be really upset me wearing this hat, but that's besides the point. Uh, <laughs> Andy, I have one, one more thing, as you like to say, which usually takes around five minutes, but this will take one more thing. A city club mug that could be used for fundraising. A city club of Chicago uh, history. A one-year membership to the city club of Chicago. And for the record, I will be sending my students from Roosevelt to monitor, monitor the BGA meetings. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>